morning. Thank you for tuning in to the second Live from the Paris Studio program. Today, painter Eric Hebert is joining us for a and next week features photographer and textile artist Lori Lambrecht. Just a note on the format, Eric will present for about 30 minutes, and then I'll come back on to help facilitate the chat session. Eric will be moving between his studio table and wall, so he won't have access to your questions during the presentation. Finally, I wanna mention that the artists have generously donated their time for this. So please support them and the museum in any way you can. Now I'll turn things over to Eric. Good morning. And thank you for attending or joining us today. Welcome to my studio. Um, we're gonna be talking about the methods and materials of painting, which is a topic that we explore regularly in the Paris Open Studio program. But with a twist today, um, and this is where the household um, cornucopia comes in, um, artists over time, or particularly through the 20th century, um, have worked with household materials during times of deprivation and economic hardship and even war. Um, today we'll be using some material that uh, you might have a lot of on hand. Um, I'd like to point that out. The supports we're working with are corrugated cardboard. This one has been primed with gesso in case you'd like to work with um, oil paint. Um, just regular paper and this is corrugated cardboard, um, just plain and then also uh, some canvas off of a roll. I'd like to show you something as well. There's other fabrics you might have around the house too. Those could be sheets. Um, they could also be, this is a very thin cotton that's used in, in sewing and tailoring. Um, a material that I like quite a bit is uh, burlap. And this is actually the same kind of burlap that one might wrap their plants with for landscaping purposes. You might, you might get a bag of potatoes with this kind of burlap. Um, and then onto a finer material, this is, this is linen as well, and, and this is really pretty wonderful. Now to work with the unstretched ones, you can work with them on the wall, just pin it up like this. This is with, with push pins. Um, but when you're done, you might consider you stretching the canvas. And these are different, can different stretcher bar lengths that you assemble. It's really easy. Just tap it in with the hammer. You have to order these or you can buy them at Art Supply. And the only other material or tool you would need would be canvas stretchers and a staple gun. Hardware store. This one, probably Art Supply store. Um, but in any case, we're working with a number of things, anything you have. And uh, so let's talk about paint really quickly. Um, again, I mentioned um, if you're working with oil paint today, um, it's not mandatory, but if, if you'd like your work to, to survive um, for maybe a couple of decades, it might be a good idea to prime it with gesso. Now, by the way, this is an acrylic gesso. You could also use white latex paint, house paint. Um, this is my favorite product. This is a PVA size. It's like a glue-like material, but a good workaround on that, if you don't have it, all you can do is you just take some household glue and mix it with a little water, and you have a clear, a clear size. Um, okay, so for paint, we're working with anything you have. Um, so these are tubes of acrylic paint, and again, you can use oil paint, but keep in mind, you'll need to use turpentine if you'd like to dissolve it. These are, these are more craft kind of acrylic paints that I just happen to have on hand. A little more liquid. It's not bad. It's, they're, they're, they're just fine to work with. Um, as far as palettes, you could use uh, paper plates. You could use wax paper parchment, paper, anything that's a little bit coated so that the, that's non-porous so that the paint rests on the surface. This is a prepared watercolor palette. 
My favorite palette in the world is just a piece of glass or plexiglass with a piece of white paper underneath. But you can also use a baking tray as well. Now, as far as um, um, palette knives, I, I really like working with palette knives a lot. I, I prefer them to brushes. And I confess, partly because I don't like to wash brushes, but um, you just wipe them off. But, but uh, anyway, these are painting knives or palette knives, different sizes. And, but you could also use a spackle knife and a plaster knife if you have these, or a plaster spatula. You could also use a kitchen spatula. Now this is assuming you're working you know, pretty big. I'd say like 10 feet by 15 feet. Um, and then we have the um, popsicle stick or tongue depressor, and I'm going to be using this in lieu of a squeegee. I didn't, couldn't find a squeegee. But I will point out, if one of the nice things about a palette knife is that it has this angle here. It's angled. And the reason that that's nice is because you could hold the, it gives you more, uh, better, better, better surface reach with the, with the angle here. If you, if you don't have those, you could use just a kind of a butter knife. You can see that, it's a regular butter knife, but it's that angle that's really important um, for ease of use. And, uh, and so let's begin. Um, um, during, uh, uh, in terms of, of things we can add to our paint or um, um, during, during, I think World War II before, well actually between the wars and after, um, um, some of the, the school of Paris artists like Picasso, they, and, and George Brock, they added um, coffee grounds and ground up eggshells into their compositions, or they painted on them, or they, they added them to their paint. But an artist that we have closer to the home that's in our own backyard is Pearl Fine. And she did some of her best work using sand. And we certainly have a lot of sand nearby as well. And so we're gonna start out with that. Um, this is Pearl Fine. It is the name of the painting is planned for the White City. This is in the Paris Permanent Collection. Um, this body of work, these are among her most popular paintings too, I understand. Um, but I, I, I notice the uh, palette. It's just primary colors, red, blue, and yellow. Um, I'm going to introduce two techniques here working with sand. This is just a way to get started. One is to, is to move more towards composition. The other one is to create a ground which we'll build on subsequently. So here, let's get started. I'm using here a regular, this is just regular household glue, student glue, white will hold glue. Um, and we're gonna go to our, our first surface here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this more as kind of a linear device. I wanna see, I don't wanna smear it so much, but um, I wanna make something that uh, engages the entire surface. And uh, I wouldn't worry too much about, uh, I wouldn't focus too much on composition except just try to engage the, the whole surface. Um, you'll be working flat, you'll be working flat. And so it'll be a little bit easier. You can work on your wall too. The next technique, we're gonna let that dry for, a, or no, no, I'll just move right to it. No, I'll let that dry for a moment. Um, I'd like to introduce another way of working. We're gonna be brushing the glue on or pouring it on this time. This is gonna be more towards preparing a surface for, for some other paint for the activity. So just pour, pour some of that same glue, okay? Add a little bit of water, don't do it too much. Don't add too much water, but just a little bit so it's a little bit more malleable. Um, I'm gonna use one of the, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use the tongue depressor to stir this. By the way, it's not really a good idea to stir your paint or glues with um, a brush. You ruin your brush really quick. Um, so anyway, we have this going and I'm gonna present two ways of applying the paint. Um, one of them will be a brush area. So, or rather the glue rub. So I'm going to be, uh, here's some brush here. Let's see what that ends up with. 
Okay. Now, if we're preparing a surface, something to keep in mind is, uh, and if you're going to be painting, painting nature, um, try to, uh, why not be nature yourself? So act like nature. So, so things like pouring, splashing, moving things around, um, that gets you there faster. It doesn't have to be the end, but it, it becomes part of the whole built surface. So we're going to splash it on here like that. And you'll see in a minute what happens. Okay, so this is some sand. By the way, you can make colored sand too. I think you could probably prepare quantities of this with watercolor or food dye and, and leave it out to dry and then crumple it up a bit. And you'd have colored sand if you want. I know in the Parish Open Studio, they have, they have um, sand in, um, in about five or six colors and it's very popular to work with. Okay, so um, again, you would be working on a flat surface. I'm not, so um, I have to sort of do it like this um, to get the sand to stick. And uh, I'd say if you're going to do this at home, you might want to have something on the floor. Um, okay, so we have something there. Okay, now for the for the white surface where it's been brushed on and splashed on, it'll be different. You'll see it's a different, uh, it's more of a, a graded experience, but you see where it's poured on, it's coming up with some, with a stronger sort of linear quality. But I like the, and you can also do this too, you just have like a whoa, like that. And then you have a little bit of the beach in your house. Okay. So we're going to let that dry for a minute, and we're going to move on to Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock. Okay. Um, now, now Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock both both of them both of them did work with with uh, these drip and poured paint elements. It wasn't just Jackson Pollock, although. His, his tend at a, his celebrated, particularly important work, often consisted of a lot of poured paint. Lee Krasner worked similarly. She, she did maybe, um, she painted into the surfaces and, and creating these compositions and finding forms. We're gonna try that here too. Um, the, uh, if we could see the Pollock one, I think that's next. Oh, that's, that's, that's it. Now you'll notice on this one, it's, it's, it's not quite as filled as, um, uh, as a Pollock painting we might think of. It's, it's, it's nice just seeing the, uh, some of those marks a little bit, or, or those drips, or poured lines a little bit more isolated. Um, so we're going to, we're going to try to do this here too. There's a couple of ways that, that we can work. Um, we can we can work with uh, um, paint in bottles here, and the way we achieve that is fairly straightforward. We, we mix the paint with some water or turpentine. We can use a funnel and pour it into the bottle. Um, I have some pre-prepared. Um, actually, these came this way. They were, I emptied half the contents out. They're, they're, they're liquid acrylic paint, so I just diluted them a little more. It's up to you what kind of a consistency you'd like. I wouldn't make it too, too wet because you'll lose the, uh, the body of the paint. But uh, if, you, if you keep it a little bit, I'd say like ketchup or mustard consistency, that would probably work pretty well. Another way to work with the paint is you can use a turkey baster and you would need a container for that. And, uh, but we're just gonna go ahead now and uh, work with um, these, these um, drip elements here. Okay. Let's try. Let's try it here with this lightish color. I'm right-handed, so I have to do it this way. 
this way. So it's really on again, if you're working on a surface, you'll have a little bit more control. We're going to have a lot of drips on this one. I think that the color you pick is important. It, uh, it's one of the ways that you can really access um, maybe whatever it is you're interested in, whether it's a landscape or a seascape. But these are color is one of the most basic tools, and it's evocative of whatever could be evocative of whatever your subject is. Of course, you know, this could be also a non-objective kind of uh, exploration too. I'm going to pull some blue in here now. And okay, well, see, that was pretty quick. Um, let's move on now. Let's think about, let's go back to the surface that we prepared with two kinds of sand application. And, uh, and again, we're using this as a ground. Um, here, I'll try it. Let's try a different, different color here. Uh, it's probably a good idea to have paper towels around too. Okay. Okay. And uh, let's also now go put some more color here. Okay, um, all right, we'll come back to this. Um, you can work on a couple of these at the same time. It's not a bad idea either. We're gonna, we're gonna go back now to the Lee Krasner piece here, and uh, I'm gonna use a brush in this case, it's like already got it going. But to bring this to life here, um, I'm sorry, this is Pearl Fine, but we can use but if we paint into this in ways, it activates some of the, the, the linear quality that we've established with the glue. And, and uh, it's pretty, we, we, we find ourselves with composition really quickly. This is something that I rely on in my own work as it is. Um, sometimes when we're in, when we've painted ourselves into a corner, it refreshes the canvas or drawing to, to um, try something very spontaneous. Um, okay, so here we have the beginning of that painting. Um, now let's, Let's move ahead here to, we're going to look at, uh, at Helen Frankenthaler for a moment. And here we go. Okay. Now, Helen Frankenthaler's paintings, many of them, or at least the earliest ones, seem to have been um, very saturated um, canvas. Um, I believe she was working with oil paint at that time, and the canvases were really soaked through. Um, one of the ways that she worked was also using a household sponge. And, uh, and on some of the large works, I, I believe she even used a kind of a sponge mop as well, which gave her it gave her some extension over the canvas. She was working flat on the floor. And uh, okay, we're ready to go back to the studio screen here. And uh, I've mixed up some 
some light blue paint, fairly liquid here. It's a liquid acrylic. Um, if you're using oil, it could certainly be just your color with serpentine. Um, and we'll demonstrate this quickly. Um, but you'll see that the work, this paint really becomes absorbed into the canvas. It's, it's, the canvas becomes saturated. And uh, it's a nice, I'll go this way. It's a nice, it's a nice way to work. And, and in some ways, the kind of surface viscosity here and the application, it does a little bit uh, look like a, uh, um, oh, a streak, a wind streak, um, body of water in nature. You could, these techniques are, are, are good for a number of purposes, representational or abstract. Um, now, the next artist we're going to talk about is um, Dan Christensen, who's also prominently um, displayed in the Paris collection right now. And one of the, the aspects of Dan's work I like quite a bit is, is uh, and it, it seems to be a, a, something he comes to quite often, um, but it's working with, it's working with um, spray. Um, now we don't we don't have to work with a, um, um, a you know a spray can or a compressor. Um, um, Dan's are 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 quite beautifully um, um, even works. Um, but with with a household can or household um, spray bottle, we can mix paint again to a consistency liquid enough to to place it in here. The other thing you can do too is you can just take the paint itself if you're working with acrylic or oil. You have to use turpentine for oil and put the paint in there and a little bit of water. And again, the consistency is really going to be up to you. And um, it's, it's really, but with the spray, it can't be too thick or it's going to clog the the spout here, or the spray is very delicate, um, the, the mist quality. You could also mix it ahead too in, in a container and then use a funnel. But, but I'll show you how nicely this works. This is on the mist setting here. Look at that. It really, it's like having a, a, sun, a sunrise. And I haven't really done anything to exceptional with it except holding it in one place. But that makes me kind of wonder what happens if we go over to this one with the sand out. And I'm going to change the setting. Let's see if we get anything any different. Oh yeah, look. Okay. Okay. Well that certainly helped that painting a lot. Um, great. And let's see what happens on the pearl fine inspired work. Well, that's nice. Let's see. I like this for the, oh yeah, the mist. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. Okay. Well, it, it, this, it activates the sand more. I think it's, it feels a little more saturated to work. And I also like the lines of the corrugated cardboard underneath that are trying to appear. Now, I'd like to um, Kara, how are we as far as time here? Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce some other techniques here too, and the, the, these are these are um, ones that I tend to to rely on personally in my in my own work and in the work that's in the parish collection as well. Um, but I use, I like to use um, an imprinting technique. And one of the exciting things about it is that you never really know what you're going to get unless, unless you take some steps to plan it. But this is something that artists like Max Ernst relied on. In fact, I don't know if it was he who coined it or maybe it was around that time, but it's called decalcomania. And it's, it's one of the, the it, it's a surrealist kind of idea. Um, 
and and uh, you interpret the forms that that you get as they're received. And to do that, you would need to use something like a um, parchment paper or a wax paper. Um, what else could you use? Now, Jean Dubuffet did this quite a bit, and he would paint back in as we did with on um, the Pearl Fine inspired piece. He would paint back in, and he would he would find all these forms. He did a whole series of bearded men, and they were they're pretty wonderful. But he used aluminum foil quite a bit. Um, you can also use recycled plastic as well, and I think the nicest one to work with is glassine. And this is used, you know, people to conserve their work. Drawing that has an archival quality. What I like about it is that it's it seems to be the liquid, but it's still a paper. And environmentally, it's not a horrible material that will last for years and years. And so, I'm making a sheet here, and uh, I'm going to prepare some paint on the palette. And I think what will we do here? We'll have let's try some. Let's try some blue. Okay, got some blue, and this green here. Okay. Use a palette knife. You could mix these. Now because I don't have I'm, I don't have any um, gloss gel or matte gel, I'm gonna use the PVA size. It's related to the gloss gel in some ways. Um, and you can prime your surfaces too with gloss gel. It's not with little, maybe it's a little bit of bit. So anyway, I'm doing this and I'm mixing some color. Okay. And okay. And then I'm gonna apply it to the surface here. And this is this is really an imprinting technique. It's kind of a form of, of simple printmaking, really. Um, and, uh, and again, it's a nice, it's a nice way to, to sort of refresh your work if it's getting too tight somewhere. You could certainly, you can make a whole sheet of this. People who, who have taken the, the parish workshop know that I, I ask everyone to save what they consider to be their disasters because we, apply sometimes a whole monoprint over the top of one of their, their works and it, and it becomes altogether something new and exciting. Okay, so we're gonna apply this paint here onto, well, let's, let's do it here. We'll do it on this work here, okay? And I'm gonna put it right there. You could use your hands, you could use a wooden spoon. And you can even use that spatula. Okay, well, enough anticipation. Let's take it off. Okay, so here we go. It's it's uh, added some depth. Um, this one seems to be going a little bit towards the realm of a seascape or some kind of uh, ocean view. Um, now, for the figurative painters, the representational painters, you could begin a painting with all of these, these kinds of starts, and, and then you could go in and further um, occupy it with whatever it is you want, boats, people, places, things. Um, let's try, let's see what a second print of this gives us here. Okay, well, there's other things we can do. 
big moving. This is something as well. Um, if your work is up on the wall like this, you could also just use the whole the whole piece of plexi as a tool too. Let's make this a little nicer. Okay. Okay, so in this case, we're using the palette, the piece of plexi itself to imprint. Okay, well, and you could use your, your tools here. And I think this one will, let's see what it looks like horizontally. Okay, there you go. Something unexpected. You have your very own Gerhard Richter inspired painting. Anyway, the, really the possibilities are endless here. These are all ways to, to really activate your surface. You could think of these as some of them as finished, some of these as beginnings, but uh, um, usually trying, trying new things brings us to new places. Um, and that's certainly true in the studio. Um, it's a, it's a, um, I find it very exciting to work with me here. Um, Kara, do you think, do we have any questions? Eric, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, great. Um, so I'll open it up now. If anyone has any questions or comments for Eric, go ahead and type them into your chat, into the chat feature. Depending on the device you have, that'll either be at the bottom or the top of the <coughs> We just have a couple of comments. Mm -hmm. One person asked, um, was that gloss gel that you added to your craft paint? Um, no, this was the size material. Because I didn't have any, any um, polymer medium, I'm using the PVA size, which is a priming material. It's kind of like glue itself. It's not dissimilar to your gel. You could use gloss, you could use gloss medium, matte medium. You could even, if you are stuck, you could even dilute some household glue. They're all, they're all somewhat related materials. Okay, we have another question asking mm -hmm. if um, one could use Mod Podge to create a res Yes, you could. You could. It's it's just another form of glue. Um, you could use you could use Mod Podge probably to. That's for I assume like the craft working. If if you wanted to dilute that a little and brush it on your surface, you could use it as a primer. You could. Um, I wouldn't make if you're if you're trying to, to use it as an adhesive. I wouldn't attach. I, I wouldn't thin it down too much because uh, it, it, you'll lose some of the adhesive quality. But if you want to add it to your paint, to your acrylic paint for um, some body um, or uh, as like sort of a glaze, 
Um, I think I think that that would probably work. One participant asked, "Is the last is the last scene is that like Lumalux that photographers use?" The glass I don't. Paper, right? I don't know, but um, glass scene the the uh, I'd say the uh, uh, kinds of th you you might see it in um, people you used to use. It has a nice archival quality. Um, it, people would use it, glassine envelopes in stamp collecting. Um, I think it's probably close to, to wax paper or wax paper bags, but that would probably work too. People used to, um, that would actually be something to use more of in our lives, would be wax paper probably as a workaround for plastic. Um, but I think it's more in that, in that family of material. We have a couple more questions about um, additives, asking mm -hmm. if even that medium could be used or wallpaper glue. Uh, I don't, I, I'm not familiar with wallpaper glue, but as long as it's a water soluble product, um, you could probably, you, you know, work with it. Now I wanna point out that, that we've got some really good examples here of people um, William de Kooning worked with house, with house paint on Leo Pistelli's front porch in East Hampton. And some of the, the, the most, um, his most iconic work is produced with that. Jackson Pollock also used house, house paint. Who knows what they use for thinner, probably paint thinner. So the thing is, is that we don't really know uh, um, about the integrity of these materials. Um, as far as lasting forever, but let's put it this way. They did these things in the in the, the heyday of abstract expressionism and they're they're hanging up in the parish and in MoMA some of, in some cases. So I think they're doing pretty well. I would say um, um, try to if, if anything is you know try to keep it water soluble with water soluble if you're working with enamels or you need or, or oil you'll need to work with uh, kind of forms of thinner. Um, I would strongly suggest maybe doing that outdoors on, out, on the driveway or lawn or, lawn or something. Um, or if you're going to work indoors, open all the doors and windows. But um, you really can use uh, these, the, uh, any number of household materials. You might even ex experiment too. Um, um, you, 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 could, you could certainly put oil and enamel on top of acrylic but never put a water base on top of an oil-based paint. It'll just won't dry and it will be a big mess for years. I'm gonna tell you two questions at once. Um, the first one was when working in the studio, if you wear an apron, and then um, someone asked if you could quickly um, demonstrate imprinting with foil, one of the things you mentioned. Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, first question is no, I usually don't. Um, wear an apron because it, I don't like how it feels on my neck. But I do often wear an old shirt. But um, I would say uh, for me, a good portion of my wardrobe is sort of studio. Um, I, I paint daily. And so um, um, the exception for me is, is, is just having some clothes that, that um, don't have paint on. So, so I, I would suggest finding old shirts or, or an apron if you like it, anything that works. And as far as the aluminum goes, I'd be happy to try that. Let's do, let me uh, clear this up a little bit here. Um, and how I got interested in this really was in part through, through Dubuffet and the work that he did with aluminum. He did these all his tabletop works, and they weren't very large. It was it was just after it was during the during World War II. He was stuck in his apartment in Paris, and and uh, he made these these beautiful works. That and all, often he would cut the pieces up and reassemble them. So let's try something. Uh, here I'm going to try something contrasting. So you see what it looks like here. This is more of a flesh colored paint here and let's see what we get.
I'd say also, whenever possible, try to use things that you've already, that are discarded already, things that are gonna go into the you know, garbage or recycle. And uh, um, that, that sort of gives it a second life. Um, depending on what it comes out like, it gives it a really good second life. Okay, so here, here's some aluminum. Let's see, let's see what happens here. I'm going to use the um, spackle knife to as a burnishing tool, and we're going to put it here. We'll put it on this wood here. A lot, of, a lot of this has to do with your paint consistency too. The thicker the paint, um, the more material it will appear. The thinner, the more glaze-like. Okay, let's see. Okay. Well, that's aluminum. You could. You can also use the knife and cut through as well. And with your extra, you can stick on it and apply it. Okay, so we, we have a sense of layers in this work here now. Things that are more surface and, and scraping through all the way through down to the paper, it gives a sort of a, a sense of, of depth as well. We have a couple more questions. Uh, one is yes. to clarify when you used water versus medium to thin the paint. So I know you use water okay. bottles. So what are you trying to get yeah. with the different mediums? That's a good question. Your your medium is not going to go very well into here, um, into the squirt. It's all because of the spray and that pipe there. So the only thing you could really add to this is going to be is going to be water. And the reason you do that is because it's going to be sort of aerosolized. Well, it's not going to have any aerosol in it, but it's got, it, will, it needs to be thin so you could spray it out. If you're going to add the medium, and this, by the way, this is not really very thick, so this is better at glazing. But some of the acrylic products, like the acrylic gel, if your paint happens to be kind of thin, if you add the gel to it, it and you use a funnel, um, you can fill up a bottle, you could fill up one of these bottles very, very, very easily. But, but you, in, with, this, with, this, with the bottle technique, with the pour technique, you really want your paint a little thicker so that you kind of have a beaded sort of line experience. Um, this, this needs to be um, about the consistency of mustard. And whereas the paint in here should be fairly, fairly liquid, like, like almost like milk, no, no thicker than milk. All right, Eric, I have a question about your own work. Do you use imprinting in your own work and do you often work in multiple layers? Oh yes, I do. Um, um, I often start a painting with um, imprinting and then I move through it and, and uh, build a surface and uh, um, other layers. Sometimes when, when I'm stuck, I'm not happy or it seems, it seems uh, I, I, I hit maybe a dead end. I put the work aside for a few days and, and uh, often I come back and I, I cover the whole thing with a very big imprint. And, and then I, as I've demonstrated on this work, I'll scrape through and I'll, I'll, I'll rediscover some of the earlier layers. And uh, it, it really contributes to 
to a full a full way of working and and I think it it it, it uses paint very effectively and to the uh, address this I idea that's unique to painting the painterly illusion of space itself so eric i think there's just one more question yes um, a few people have asked if they could see the examples more closely would it be possible to unpin them and bring them toward your phone let me untake the phone up to that okay let's see how that works how that works Okay. Can you see that all right? Move back just a little. Now they're seeing me. It's interesting because um, Helen Frankenthaler and Dan Christensen both hang in the parish um, collection often at the same time. And uh, I've seen these works a good deal and I very much admire both of them. But I, I have to say, I'm having, I'm missing that work. And so this to me is, is sort of both of them morphed a little bit. Um, but, uh, but hey, art history is for, is, it, it's our history too. Um, this one here is, we didn't do anything else with it. Um, I, I think the palette, I'm happy with the palette and uh, the, the quality of the paint itself. It seems it has a sort of a sheen to it. And, but this was an unprimed surface, but because this is acrylic, it's not gonna hurt this over time. It won't dissolve. I mean, the paper might, but the, but the um, paint's not gonna work against the paper. Um, this one is more experimental here, but the part I like is right, is in there. It's just the, it's just the layers. Um, but this one, this, is, this has sand and acrylic paint. Um, and then here, this, one's, this one is really a monochromatic painting. And um, there's no color but red, but vermilion in there and a little bit of the, the sand in the cardboard, but um, there's uh, some harmony between, there's something very honest about this, um, in my opinion. Let me put this back. Okay. There, how's that? Great, you look great. Thanks for doing that, Eric. I, there's just Thank one you. more question. It, just to yes. clarify, you mentioned about working with acrylics and oil together. What were some of the guidelines for that? Yes, you can. Um, as long as um, you can always use oil on top of acrylic, uh, assuming the acrylic is dry. Um, I have done that in my own work from time to time. I paint mostly with oil, but, but, but occasionally I will prepare a surface with, with the spray technique, or sometimes I'll use some of this pour technique as well. And, and it gives me something to respond to. And, and the nice thing about acrylic is that it dries relatively quickly and, and uh, it's, it's easy, you know, it's water soluble, easy to work with. And then after that's dried, I give it maybe about oh, a week or two, um, I'll sometimes uh, um, size it with the PVA size. I'll do it right over the acrylic, even um, if I hadn't sized it before. And, and then I'll begin to work with oil. And, and that's just fine. You can, do, you can do anything once it's dry. You see, acrylic paint is essentially today the same material that, that uh, gesso is made out of, acrylic gesso. And of course, we use oil on top of acrylic gesso. And so that's, uh, you, you know, that's common practice now. a lot of really nice thank yous which i want to reiterate thank you for doing this um for the parish audience really really wonderful i hope everyone enjoyed it and i hope everyone can join us next week oh thank you can may i say one thing too kara 
Yeah, I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to thank Tara and Victor and the Paris Art Museum. We've had a lot of fun in the open studio workshop for the last couple of years. And, uh, and that's possible because people, uh, they join the museum, they, they become members, and, and they also donate to the museum as well. It's, it's not just a place that exists, it's really, it's a living place. And, and this is really the nexus for many of us. It's our community and it's our home. And so I, plea, I, I hope that you'll consider joining and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.